Hey, David, I think we're okay. There we go. All right, David, you're a man who can hit his cues. Well done. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. Really glad that you're here. Very happy to see you, those of you whom I can see. I'm glad that you're here tonight to do a little bit of learning. Thanks for giving us an hour of your Tuesday to spend some time uh, learning from a new teacher from outside our community, but someone who comes very highly recommended and with a really impressive resume about which you'll be hearing in just one moment. A word about the format of the evening so everybody is prepared. Um, I'll have the honor of introducing our guest teacher for the evening. She's going to present for 25 or 30 minutes or so. Um, after that, we'll have a chance to ask questions, offer comments or feedback. Um, and Roberta has been very gracious about offering to make this a little bit more of a conversation than just a, a lecture. Um, she's probably very used to giving lectures in her day job. So tonight's going to be a little bit different. It'll be a little bit more of a conversation. Um, also, a heads up that we are recording this evening's meeting mm -hmm. um, so that those who aren't with us will have a chance to, to view it a little bit later, people that couldn't make it this evening. So one more reminder that uh, we're in regular Zoom meeting mode tonight. So if your mic hasn't yet been muted, um, that's a good chance to make sure that it is so that we can uh, hear just our presenter's audio during tonight's talk. So um, with all of that um, housekeeping out of the way, I get the honor of introducing our speaker and presenter this evening. Um, so Roberta and I are um, newish friends, and we were just remarking a moment ago that this is actually the first time that we've laid eyes on each other in real time. We have mutual friends and run in some of the same circles. Um, I've been delighted about the idea of having her come teach to our community since I learned about uh, the book that she'll be speaking to us about tonight. Um, let me say a word about where she comes to us from and, and the elements of her background that qualify her to, to talk on this subject tonight. Um, so Roberta Qual is a, a law professor by day, a professor at the DePaul University College of Law. So she's, I think, streaming with us this evening from Chicago. Um, her educational background provided her with an undergraduate degree from Brown, uh, majoring in religious studies, and her law degree from Penn. Uh, which is accompanied as well by a master's degree in Jewish studies, so she knows of which she speaks. Um, in addition to her work lecturing about the law, um, she has published all sorts of different articles in a variety of different publications uh, uh, covering topics of Jewish law, Jewish culture, um, authorship rights, intellectual property, and so on. Um, this is this book that she'll be speaking to us about tonight is her third publication. Um, so she is also quite an accomplished and uh, a very impressive uh, author. She has written in all sorts of different publications that you've heard about and heard of and no doubt read. She's written uh, pieces for the Wall Street Journal, for the Chicago Tribune, uh, and just about every Jewish publication you can name, the, for the JTA, Commentary Magazine, Jerusalem Report, Jerusalem Post, The Forward, and on and on and on and on. But tonight she's going to be talking to us about her new book, which is called Remix Judaism. The subtitle of the book is Preserving Tradition in a Diverse World, uh, which is, I think, an aim and a goal that all of us hold as members of this congregation and as committed lifelong adult Jewish learners. Um, so I'm very delighted to get to share some space and some time together with you tonight and to be uh, like you, uh, a student of our new teacher, Roberta Qual. Roberta, welcome to Houston. Welcome to Emmanuel. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And it really is an honor to be here. And it's particularly an honor. Um, I will share with your congregants that actually, I don't remember how we first got connected, um, I, how, what the initial introduction was, Rabbi, but your esteemed rabbi actually was one of the people who actually gave me comments for the cover of my book. And they were wonderful comments. And I was, you know, deeply, deeply um, grateful. So, um, you know, so we do go back a, a couple of years at least. Um, so so I, I'm going to, um, as the rabbi said, I, I would like to speak for no more than 25, 30 minutes max, just to give you um, a sense of what the book is doing, what it tries to do. Um, and then I would love to open it up for conversation and to hear people's thoughts and, and reactions and, and whatever else people might want to share um, this evening. So um, I always enjoy hearing the backstories of books. Why do people write the books that they do? And, and as the rabbi indicated, this is actually my third monograph, meaning it's my third um, you know, solo authored um, book that isn't a case book. I actually have written a couple of case books that, that I use to teach law in my law school classes, but, but a monograph is different. It explores something thematically. And, and, and this is the, the third such book of that sort that I've written. 
But the backstory of this book um, actually actually goes back a little bit uh, to, to two of my other uh, publications. So I'd like to maybe share a little bit with you about how I came to write this book, because I think that's an important part of the story and what it is we're going to be speaking about this evening. So um, as the rabbi indicated, I my, my background in law is, is intellectual property. Um, I, I have written for many, many, many decades about uh, copyright law in particular, and copyright law is the area of law that protects works of authorship, art, literature, music, dance, even computer programs, actually, um, wide variety of things that we call works of authorship is protected by copyright law. The niche of copyright law that, that probably I've done probably more writing than just about any law professor is a doctrine. Um, it's a doctrine called moral rights. Um, and so what that is, because it's it's relevant to, to remix Judaism, what moral rights is, it's the rights that that authors, and by authors, I mean people who create any of the types of create, creations that I mentioned before. Um, it's about whether they can um, have a cause of action if somebody else comes along and changes their work without their permission or misattributes their work. Um, and, and even attribution, the right to have your name on your work, right? So that's not guaranteed by copyright law. That copyright law does not provide you with attribution, nor does it provide you with the right to complain if your work is misattributed or mutilated, right? That's the doctrine of moral rights. And the United States actually has the skinniest and the least viable moral rights law of pretty much any country in the world, including third world countries. It's, 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 it's crazy. And so I wrote a lot about this. And in the course of writing about moral rights, I stumbled into the area of why do people create? Because my argument always was we need to protect uh, works of authorship because of the spiritual component of creativity. When authors create, it's not always about the money. That's what copyright law protects, it's the money. But it's really about that spiritual enterprise. So thinking about why authors create from a spiritual perspective led me down the path of Bereshit, right? The, the most famous creation stories, right, in the world, which, which is in our Torah, of course. And I saw that there was so much in the Jewish tradition that really spoke to why do people create, not just in the Torah, but in all of the commentaries. It's a very fertile, fertile ground of discussion. And I was fascinated. So along that time, when I was finishing my first book, which is, which is called The Soul of Creativity, it, it's, a, it's about this doctrine of moral rights. Um, I started to, to, to learn, I mean, I've always studied Judaism and, and been active in terms of learning, but I decided to deepen that a little bit more. And, and I, I woke up one day and I had this eureka moment. And there really is such a thing as a eureka moment as part of human creativity. And I thought to myself, gee, the question I had been asking about this doctrine of moral rights, how much can a work of authorship change and still be the work of the author, right? I realized you could ask that same question about Jewish tradition. And I thought to myself, man, that is a really interesting thing to be thinking about. And I knew I wanted to write about that. How much can the tradition change and still be Jewish, right? So um, this was probably around 2007 or eight. And that was in the day when you could actually get an editor of a, um, a, uh, a, a a press on the phone, you can't really anymore. And I happened to get an editor at Oxford and I pitched my idea to him. And he was not Jewish, but he said, I'm fascinated with that. He said, I think that would be a great idea. Um, write up a proposal, which I did. And I wrote this proposal up to really look at the whole history of Jewish law and how Jewish law is influenced by the cultures surrounding the outside cultures in which the Jews have lived for centuries, and also the cultures of the Jews and how law and culture intersect. And basically, my last book was called The Myth of the Cultural Jew. It, it, it's, an, it's more of an academic book, meaning, you know, it was something that's read by and still is read by, by rabbis and law professors and Jewish studies professors. But it really is a look at halakha. It's a look at Jewish law as the law and the culture intersect. Now, 
around 2013, I was writing the last chapter of that book, The Myth of the Cultural Jew. And that chapter was on American Judaism. I had started with Torah and I went all the way up through the centuries to, uh, to first that, to, to Israel and, and then to, to the United States. And in 2013, a very important study came out. The study was called, was the most at that point comprehensive study of the American Jewish community. And it was called the Pew Report, the 2013 Pew Report. And I, as I was writing that last chapter, I was also slogging through all the data in the Pew Report. And there was a lot of hand-wringing in the Jewish community of all denominations when it came out. Because the statistics of Pew um, back in 2013, and then I will say reaffirmed in the more recent Pew Report of 2020, which just came out last May, it was delayed by COVID, is really, is really indicating that this is where we're headed in the United States. Now, Israel is a little different. We can talk about Israel in the Q&A, but, but I'm speaking now specifically in the United States. And this is where we're headed. Um, where we're headed is that we have um, a sector of American Jews. They are not currently the majority, but they are growing and they are strong and they are observant. They are dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's of Jewish law observance. Now that is the Orthodox. Those are Orthodox Jews. And there's a very, you know, Orthodox, Orthodox Judaism is probably the least homogenous group of Jews because there's so many variations with Orthodox Jews. But I think one thing that really does hold them all together is that they all at least are claiming to be living within the system of Jewish law known as halakha. Okay, so they're strong. Their defection rate, by the way, according to the most recent Pew is, is 30%, higher than I would have expected, to be honest, but they're strong and they're thriving and there's a high birth rate and they're doing okay. I mean, but for all the resurgence of anti-Semitism and things of that sort, right? But, but they're, they're strong Jewishly. So what about the rest? The rest are what I call liberally religious Jews. And by the way, I use that term to refer to Jews that are affiliated and unaffiliated, but those who are affiliated are affiliated with conservative Judaism, reform Judaism, reconstructing Judaism, humanistic Judaism, renewal, like all the way, okay, over, as well as Jews who, who are not affiliated necessarily. And so the term that I use are liberally religious Jews, which are also uh, very heterogeneous. There's a, there's a wide range, but what we know and what we're seeing and what the data is very, very clear on is among this group of Jews, um, Jewish tradition is declining in importance. Jewish practice is declining in importance. Jewish learning, that's hard to measure. There's more Jewish learning going on, actually, I would say, especially post-COVID with the, with the influx of Zoom alternatives. Um, but even before that, there's a lot of online content. But the interest in Jewish literacy, I, I think, is, still, is definitely on the decline. Um, and then among younger Jews, and this is the part that's really difficult for all of us to really grapple with. The youngest cohort that the Pew Report examined were Jews between the ages of 18 and 29. And what we see in that group in particular is an even less interest in Jewish practice, less interest in Judaism, less interest in con Jewish continuity, more interest in more universal types of themes. The data is pretty clear. So the question that um, motivated me back in 2013 when I was finishing up The Myth of the Cultural Jew is I wanted to write a book that would be geared to a wide audience, not just scholars, not just rabbis, um, not just professors, but really a wide audience of people to really talk about how can we elevate Jewish observance in a way that works for liberally religious Jews. Now, one of the big differences that we have to acknowledge and work with is that what drives liberally religious Jews to do any Jewish tradition is different from what drives Orthodox Jews. So the majority of Orthodox Jews, maybe not 100%, but certainly the vast majority, practice what they practice because they believe they're commanded to observe this Jewish tradition. Orthodox Jews tend to function by a sense of commandedness. That is not true of liberally religious Jews. That doesn't mean liberally religious Jews do not believe in God. I'm not saying that. But there's a, there's, there's a gap between belief in God and even a strong belief in God and belief that the entire system of Jewish tradition is mandated by God. Most liberally religious Jews do not have that same framework, that same structure. And so if they're going to practice Jewish tradition, 
there has to be a different type of motivator than commandedness. So that was my starting point for remix Judaism. Like, how do we get Jews to think more about the practice of Judaism, all aspects of Jewish tradition? And again, you know, that my prior book, The Myth of the Cultural Jew, is really all about showing how Jewish law, how aha, and Jewish culture, what we think of as the tradition or the norms, they intersect. You can't really separate them. So how do we get more observance among this particular group of Jews that I'm speaking about. In my book, Remix Judaism, and by the way, this is the, um, the paperback edition just came out in March. Um, I wrote a brand new preface for it that actually talked about uh, the Pew 2020 report and why it, it's so significant for, for, for this book, the continued life of this book that, that again, uh, originally came out in its hardcover edition uh, back in two years ago in 2020. But it's, it's, it's as, if not more relevant now, given what we see and given what we see as the state um, of, of American of American Jews. In the book, I use a lot of uh, narrative. Some of my narrative is Torah narrative. Some of it is called Agadah. That's narrative from the Talmud. Some of it are stories in the media that I found, and some of it, some of it is autobiographical as well. And I think storytelling is a really important vehicle for transmission of points of view and transmission of knowledge. So I wanted to um, start, um, uh, or, or start in terms of getting drilling down into the book with a narrative that actually does come from the Talmud. And when I use Talmudic narrative or Talmudic Agadah in Remix Judaism, I like to quote the exact phraseology of, of the Talmud. Um, and the reason I do that, it, rather than just a summary, the reason that I do that is because I want my readers to have a window into the world of the sages and what their language sounded like and what their stories sound like. So again, I'm going to read to you um, this narrative. This is from the Tractate of the Babylonian Talmud, uh, Tractate Ta'anit. And this, this narrative is about a man named Honi, who's actually a, quite a personality in Talmudic uh, lore. Uh, he's otherwise known, some of you may recognize the name, he's also called the Circle Maker, and he's involved involved in rainmaking and things of that sort, but that's not the point of this narrative. The point of this narrative is really about why remix Judaism is important, although of course that's not, the term remix Judaism does not appear in the Aramaic or the Hebrew translation, I want to be clear. Okay, so one day Honey was journeying on the road and he saw a man planting a carob tree. He asked him, how long does it take for this tree to bear fruit? And the man replied, 70 years. He then further asked him, are you certain you're going to live another 70 years? And the man replied, I found ready grown carob trees in the world as my forefathers planted them for me. So too do I plant them for my children. Honey sat down to have a meal and sleep overcame him. As he slept, a rocky formation enclosed upon him and he continued to sleep for another 70 years. This is Tom Yudagagada. You have to take the timing with a bit of a grain of salt, of course. When Honey awoke, he saw a man gathering the fruit of the tree, and he asked him, are you the man who planted the tree? And the man replied, and I love this part, I am his grandson. So what does that teach us? First of all, that teaches us that it is the job of one generation to plant the vineyards, to plant the trees for the next generation. If the, if the, if the generation before doesn't prepare the path, the path will simply not be prepared. But I also liken um, Jewish tradition to the carob fruit that is mentioned in this, in this Agadah. Um, and why is that? Because, you know, we always want a world with carob fruit. It may look a little different, taste a little different, feel a little different from, from, from one generation to the next, but we always want it to be there. And I would suggest to you that we can think about Jewish tradition in very much the same way. We always want a world where there is Jewish tradition and a rich culture of Jewish tradition, even though it may change from time to time. And of course, the ever-present question, remember what we started out with, or I started out with those, well, how much can it change and still be Jewish tradition? There's no one answer to that last question, right? It's going to depend on your community. It's going to depend on a variety of things, but it's something we have to be thinking about because clearly we don't want everything to be changing completely. That is basically going to be something that we don't want um, to happen because then it, it is no longer Jewish tradition and there is a point where that happens. So I wanna share with you um, now what I see as the elements of remix Judaism. 
um, as I've developed that theory. And then I want to give you some examples to sort of um, just set the stage and concretize um, how we apply these elements or how they're utilized. Um, and then um, maybe tell you a little bit about what kinds of things I cover in the book, what topics I cover, and maybe throw it out then um, for discussion. So um, my my perspective here is that it is possible for individuals to, to find an authentic yet personal meaning in Jewish tradition, because remember that personal meaning is so important when you're dealing especially with liberally religious Jews who don't operate out of commandedness, um, when several conditions exist. So first and foremost, people are going to exercise individuality as to that which they practice. They're not gonna be doing everything, right? It's going to be very much a pick and choose kind of, kind of experience. Um, and what's important, however, is that that which people do practice is, is embedded with their own personal meaning in the tradition. Because if something matters to you, it means something to you. If you have a personal meaning that you can identify with the tradition, you will observe the tradition. And so this process is very much one that, that requires intentionality and it requires mindfulness. Actually, to my surprise, three out of the 23 people that endorse my book are Orthodox rabbis and Jewish professionals. I was surprised about that. Um, and yet what they like about the book is the focus on mindfulness and intentionality. That's not something that is always present in, in, in you know, very religious communities um, where, where again, we're, we're talking about observing based on command and obligation. And so they liked that. They liked that the idea of intentionality and mindfulness and thinking through what your Jewish practice is going to look, at, look like with a lot of um, intentionality is another part of this. Um, consistency. Consistency is imperative, especially when you're talking about not just the personal meaning, a deeper personal meaning for individuals, but passing the tradition down the line to the next generation. Consistency is important. Children function based on consistency. If they see something being done consistently, there is a much greater likelihood that they're going to be inclined to follow suit, but that consistency is important. And also, and this comes back again to the question I started with, the practices that are adopted, that are embraced, do need to reflect at least to some degree the authenticity of the tradition. And people always say, I get this question all the time, well, how do you know everything's authentic? And Judaism has changed significantly. Of course, Judaism is, has always been a work in progress. Those of you who, who study even a little bit of Talmud, you know, know that rabbinic Judaism is a remix of Torah Judaism, right? It, it, yes, of course. But again, there still is a framework. It's not like 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 the rabbis of the of the Talmud were coloring completely outside the box, and, and nor can we color completely outside the box if we want to preserve Jewish tradition. So again, you need to have this link back into the authenticity of the tradition. Two other points I think are important. One is that. Um, even for people who are not observing everything, and as I said, you know, Jews are not observing everything, it's really important to approach Jewish tradition from a sense of respectfulness, not, not self-effacement, not disrespect, but respect. Even if you're not completely complying with everything, the respect for the tradition is absolutely critical, particularly, again, if you're talking about transmission and consistency. And finally, finally, um, but certainly not least, joy. The joy the transmission of the joy in Jewish tradition, that has to be uppermost. And particularly when you're dealing with young people, they don't really want to be told, especially today's uh, Gen Z uh, folks, you know, who are the younger cohort of Gen Z. Gen Z was born between 1995 and 2010. So we're talking about the younger ones who are still home with their parents. They don't like, no, you know, they have, they're, they're a very fluid generation and joy, joy is what resonates with them, right? And that makes sense, you know, when we are such a joyful tradition. So we need to really tap in to the joyfulness of that tradition. So um, a lot of times people say to me, well, if there was only one thing you could recommend that people do, um, what would you recommend? And, and, and I don't even have to think about that because to me, it's so clear. And that is if every Jewish or even partially Jewish family were to take one hour every Friday night, begin with candle lighting, even if it's not um, before sundown, right? Even if it's not before sundown, uh, begin with candle lighting, say the brachot over the wine and the challah, and have a one hour technology-free 
dinner, one hour, just one hour, and maybe conclude with a little bit of a Birchat Hamazon, you know, with the hand motions and the fun things that they do at all, all those Jewish camps, right? The Pew Report and the Pew Statistics and the American Jewish community would look completely different than it does now, one hour a week. It's consistency. So, you know, when I was writing the book, it was very clear to me that the chapter on Shabbat had to end holidays, of course, that that's one chapter, it had to be the first chapter because that's a starting point. It gives us the opportunity for a consistent uh, development of a consistency of Jewish practice. So let me give you a couple of examples. Um, one I just alluded to, lighting Shabbat candles. All right, so again, um, you know, I'm not a rabbi. I'm not on a member of any law committee. The reform movement has a law committee. Um, I, I, I know Mark Wachowski very well, who's involved in that law committee. Um, and uh, the conservative movement has a law committee. I'm not a part of a law committee. So when people say, well, I can't get home in time to light my candles before sundown, should I still light them? And people ask that a lot, actually. Um, and my answer is really clear. You know, I always say, look, I light my candles before before sundown. I, I, if I can't, for whatever reason, I just, I don't light them. But the question I always say is like, do you believe it's a sin to strike a match on Shabbat? And uh, everybody I've ever said that to said, no, of course not. And I, that's the answer I usually expect to get. Um, and, and even though the Torah does prohibit lighting fire on Shabbat, that's one of the few biblically prohibited activities in the Torah, but most people don't, don't see that as a sin. And so my response is always, well, if you don't see that as a sin, yes, welcome Shabbat into your home with your family whenever you're able to do it, even if it's not at the you know, prescribed time. Now that's a remix. It's actually a remix that's violating halakha. Okay, but... Um, there are good reasons, I feel, especially when it comes to transmitting the culture where it's important to do that. Now, if you are going to ask, um, you know, an Orthodox Kiruv rabbi who does Orthodox outreach like Chabad or one of the other groups, they would not give you that answer. Um, I've talked to many of them about remix Judaism, and they will say under the radar, I really like your approach. I really agree with what you're doing. I see what you're doing. It's, it's coming from a really good place. But of course, that violates halakha, that is a remix, but I still think there are good reasons um, to take that approach. Here's another example. This is not in the book. It happened after the book went to press. My middle daughter, I three girls, my middle daughter called me and she said, mom, I got to tell you something. Um, she said, Jeremy, who at the time he was her uh, fiance, they, now her husband, he's not eating pork anymore. And I'm like, oh, thank God, Baruch Hashem. I was so excited because all I could think about is their future my future grandkids not being exposed in their home to anything pig related. I was so happy. This was the best news. And I said, so Rachel, does he want to connect more with his Jewish religion? She asked very, you know, hopefully. And my daughter said, no, not at all. And I said, oh, okay, well, that's all right. So what's going on? She goes, well, you know, he feels really badly for the animals. And I said, oh, all right. Well, I, 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 get, I get that. And I said, but so is he giving up all meat? Is he becoming a vegetarian? And she said, oh, no, 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 not at all. He's eating hamburger. He's eating beef. And I said, what's the difference? And she just looked at me and she said, mom, don't you know the pigs, they're treated so much worse than the cows are treated. And I like burst out laughing because that was just so funny. <laughs> and I couldn't help it. But this is important to him. He's a huge animal person, an animal rights activist, an animal person. And this matters to him. This is his personal meaning. So, she, so Rachel said, well, he's doing it for the wrong reason. And I said to her, there is no wrong reason. You know, the fact is he's doing it. It doesn't matter why he's doing it. And when you have kids someday, and by the way, she's pregnant now, um, when you have kids one, someday, you can explain to them, look, this is an authentic Jewish tradition. Daddy may be doing it for this reason, but this is still part of our authentic Judaism. Um, I have a chapter on, in the book on food. It was, I was dreading writing this chapter because I'm not someone that really loves spending time in the kitchen. My agent insisted I get the stories of the chefs, which I had to do by reading cookbooks, which I don't, don't typically spend a lot of time doing. But the one of the books that I loved the most what, that I read for the research is a book published by the Reform Movement's Press, the CCAR, CCAR Press, and it's called The Sacred Table. I highly recommend this book. Um, it's really an anthology um, written and most of the pieces, if not all are written by reform rabbis and it's about their kosher journeys and what drove them to you know, start observing or continue observing. It's a phenomenal book. And, and I really talk a lot about the role, not just of food, but the role of kashrut in, in preserving and observing Jewish tradition. 
Um, another example that, that I want to give you of Remix is a very sweet story. Uh, this one, this story I found in our local Federation magazine. Um, it's about a young mom in the Chicago area. And at the time she wrote this, it was a few years ago, she had three young sons. They were in Jewish preschool, but she would call herself a cultural Jew. She would say she's, they're not religious, but identified. And, you know, at the time her kids were in Jewish preschool. She grew up in a reform synagogue, actually a large reform synagogue here in the Chicago suburbs, um, where she is where her parents are still members and she herself and her family are now affiliated. So she went back to her, her the, the synagogue of her roots. Um, and so she, her boys were upset at night, they were having bad dreams. And she thought she would lay down with each of her sons and say, um, recite with each one separately one line, the first line of the Shema. And she wanted to basically get their mind off bad dreams. And so she, she started, she instituted this ritual with them. Now, there is a Jewish uh, practice, uh, command, if you will, to say a special version of the Shema before you go to bed at night. That's not why she was doing this. She was doing this to get her boys settled down and so they wouldn't have bad dreams. But she started this this practice, which taps into the authenticity of Jewish tradition for sure, um, because she wanted to settle her boys down. So now the boys are all in grade school. Um, I actually happen to know the author. She's uh, the sister of one of my son-in-laws, right? So she's actually family as well. Um, her boys are now in grade school, but they all do this themselves. They all say the first line themselves. Now that's a perfect remix. It taps into the authenticity of the tradition. It's based on a Jewish practice. It was done for different reasons, but it was done consistently and it set a pattern. And I like to think that one day when her boys grow up and maybe they have kids of their own, that they might do this with their, with their own children, God willing, you know, I'll be around and I'll be able to know and ask them. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, so um, I want to just uh, read one other excerpt um, of my book. And this one is, uh, goes back to the um, idea of having a respect for the tradition and why that's so important. So this, this particular narrative is a little bit autobiographical, um, and, but I wanna share it with you because I think it really does embody the importance of respect for Jewish tradition, even if you're not completely observing. So I vividly recall a story that my father who had been raised in a very Orthodox home often shared with me as I was growing up. There was a tray hot dog stand near non-kosher hot dog stand near his elementary school that he always found very tempting. One day he just gave in and he decided to buy a hot dog on his way home from school. That particular day, his mother fixed bananas, cottage cheese and sour cream. That's an East Coast type delicacy, I think. And he had no choice but to eat it because he didn't want to tell her he had eaten the non-kosher hot dog. So my father's first infraction of the dietary laws um, was uh, not only uh, eating non-kosher meat, but also mixing meat and milk by consuming the dairy too soon after he had eaten the meat. Now he was probably seven or eight at the time that this happened to him. And by the time I was old enough to hear and really understand the story, it was at least 35 years later. My dad was a little older when I was born. Yet the recollection of the guilt he felt was still very clear. And he was able to communicate that guilt to me. And this is all the more interesting because at the time, our home was not exactly kosher, but more kosher style. And my father was not particularly strict about observing the dietary laws. This story was my first introduction to kashrut. It was how I first learned both that certain meats are not kosher and that mixing meat and milk is prohibited. I also learned, even if not on a conscious level, that um, these rules represent a fundamental part of what it means to be Jewish. Even though my father was not uh, keeping kosher when he recounted this narrative, he was very clear to me about how important being Jewish was to him and therefore that it should also be important to me. Now, I can't say for sure whether hearing this story repeatedly during my childhood um, was a factor in my decision to begin keeping kosher shortly before my bat mitzvah, I do believe it played a part. And after that happened, my mom had to redo the whole kitchen, <laughs> so which she did. Um, so other topics I cover in Remix Judaism, other than food and holidays, um, I cover marriage. And you cannot do a book like this and talk about Jewish marriage without, of course, also talking about intermarriage. I'm happy to have some Q&A on that if you like. It's a, it's a really, really important topic, uh, not just for Reform Judaism, also that's also become a very, very big 
topic of discussion in conservative Judaism um, as well. And so I, I address that issue substantially in remix Judaism. I have a book on children's Jewish education and B'nai Mitzvah, which is a chapter rather on B'nai Mitzvah and Jewish children's education that has become completely remixed in the past 10 or 15 years. Um, and of course, I have a chapter on tikkun olam and how that fits into the equation. Uh, Jewish mourning practices, which have a very enduring power. Um, and then I have a chapter on grandparenting. Um, I was not a grandparent for most of the time that I wrote that book, that chapter on grandparenting. Um, however, I based it on many of my friends uh, who provided wonderful material. And that chapter is different. It's actually written in a fictional narrative style uh, through three couples eyes who have lots of issues um, with their children and grandchildren. And it really goes about suggesting how grandparents can help influence their grandkids' uh, Jewish journeys. I do now have grandchildren, a grandchild and another on the way. And so I'm getting to actually um, put my money where my mouth is and utilize all the strategies that I wrote about in the grandparenting chapter. Um, and of course, my last chapter um, is, uh, is about, again, uh, authenticity and faith. Um, I talk about faith, faith in God in the last chapter and where it plays, where it comes into play, as well as uh, what some of the emergent Jewish uh, institutions are doing. But by and large, this is not a book about Jewish institutions, other than the chapters that deal specifically with education um, and areas such as that. It's really about developing a personal practice um, of which institutions, of course, are, are an important part and, and, a and the idea of transmission. So I wanna close with a quote by Rav Cook, who was the, known as the first chief rabbi of Israel prior to it becoming a state. Um, and I think that though he wasn't talking about remix Judaism, I think that this particular quote of his really encapsulates completely the exact concept of remix Judaism. Um, I'll read it first in Hebrew, it's short, and then in English. Hayashan yitchadesh, the old shall become new, v'chachadash yitkadesh, and the new shall become sanctified. Um, that's kind of how I see remix Judaism. And so with that, I would love to um, open up our discussion, um, hear what people want to talk about more, questions, comments, whatever whatever people feel like um, bringing on, would love to, to dialogue with you for the rest of our time. Great, Roberta, thank you so much. Thanks for the presentation. Thanks for you bringing your wonderful presence and your beautiful experience and um, the rich wisdom of your book to our community and our congregation. <clears throat> While people are sort of coming up with their questions and comments that they want to share, and again, you can do that by hitting your raise hand button um, or just unmuting and chatting or dropping something in the chat box, whatever works for you. Let me let me start. I'll sort of um, pull rank as the as the moderator tonight to ask the first question. Um, so first of all, I want to start with a, um, a compliment. I really love um, your phrasing. I love your wording of liberally religious Jews. Um, I love that a lot because it, it solves a problem that I've sometimes been faced with, which is when I refer to our community or sort of like-minded folks in our community as liberal Jews or progressive Jews, um, sometimes that sort of people bristle because they feel like, well, I'm not politically liberal. I'm not culturally right. liberal. I don't want to call myself a liberal Jew. It seems like it's describing me a person as a liberal. Um, but I think your your wording solves that problem really elegantly. So call it a vote. I love that phrasing. I'm going to um, shamelessly steal it, but we'll try to remember to credit you, understanding your stance on intellectual property. <laughs> so, um, here, so here's my question. Um, so your description of remix Judaism, um, respect for tradition, uh, quest for meaning, wanted to make sure that it remains um, um, elevating and joyful. Um, so the reform rabbi in the room wants to ask you, so so what what you're describing sounds to me a lot like Reform Judaism. What what makes Remix Judaism yeah. different from Reform Judaism? Right. And by the way, I think the conservative rabbi in the room would say the same thing, right? And the Reconstructing Judaism rabbi in the in the room would say the same thing, right? All the liberally religious rabbis would say the same thing. Okay. I think we have to be honest, however, about the gap that exists in most liberally religious Jewish communities between the world of their rabbis and the world of their congregants. And it's, and it's closing that gap that I think has to be more of a priority um, for the clergy as well as for, for the laity. And that's where I think the problem lies, right? Um, 
Now, again, you know, you asked that question in terms of rabbis. And so just just as an aside, for people who are not affiliated, they don't have the benefit necessarily of a rabbi or whatever. So for them, it's a it's the answer would be different. It's like, no, this is a guide. This is a guide. But it's also a guide for people who are affiliated, because I just don't think we talk about it enough in our synagogues. I mean, just as a case in point, I don't know, there are maybe 800 reform synagogues in the country, 900, maybe I'm not even sure, maybe more. Um, you know, somewhat, somewhat less conservative synagogues, but we're still talking about a lot of synagogues, you know, in the United States, a lot of synagogues. I have spoken at maybe 120 over the past two years, and it's a lot, you know, I'm grateful. It has been wonderful to, to talk about this, right? I'm not complaining, but think about, I, but I do have to say, when it comes to the, the world of institutional Judaism, ritual, tradition, it's not high on the radar screen. It just isn't. You know, there's a there's a tendency to get people in who are going to talk about topics that are going to fill the house, and ritual is not nearly as sexy as other things that they that that people may may want to talk about. Uh, DEI, DEI, for example, is something that is a lot of discussion. Social justice, even tikkun olam. You know, that's people are not as interested in ritual, and that's the problem. So yes, is it is it is it necessarily, it's certainly consistent with the principles of both reform and conservative Judaism and reconstructing Judaism. But what I'm seeing, and this is really the problem is that there's not enough emphasis on it. And so I think that emphasis has to, of course, start at the top, you know, with rabbis who care about ritual and who want their congregants to do more um, in a way that will work for them, but to do more. And there, and I do have to say, therein lies, I think, a large part of the problem. Great, thank you. That's a great answer to the question. Other comments or questions from others? All right, I'll ask one more while we're waiting. Tell me what, so you you have, as you mentioned, you, you've spoken to all kinds of different groups, you've spoken to folks all along the whole spectrum of Observe, observe, observance and belief and, and praxis. Um, do you, when you speak to, um, let's say, when you speak to Orthodox or Orthoprax communities, um, what's the what's the response like? How are you received? Um, what's the pushback? What questions do they ask that you're not going to get asked here in, in this community? Sure. So that's an interesting question. Um, and the answer, I think, maybe you'll find interesting. Maybe you'll find not surprising. I don't know. I've never actually been invited to speak at an Orthodox synagogue. So even though um, I have a podcast that I ho- that I do with Rabbi Avi Feingold, who is Orthodox, and Avi and I are good friends, and we've done this podcast now for, for two years, we've had phenomenal guests, uh, including Rabbi Ellenson, uh, who's one of our guests, and he was terrific. But um, I think, you know, the, the nature of what, of, of who an Orthodox synagogue would bring in this would not be something that I think they would see as relevant to their community for the most part, because their people are observing. And so they don't really, I mean, yes, maybe more mindfulness is good, you know, as as Avi had said to me, but, but, you know, it's not necessarily relevant for them and their practice. So they would really rather hear a a Talmudist or a Torah scholar or somebody who can sort of quote the sources, or maybe somebody who can speak about you know the history of Orthodox Judaism and or the sociology of Orthodox Judaism. Um, so it's not something that I think you know would necessarily be seen as a draw for an Orthodox um, community. And I and I understand that. I, I have absolutely you know no problem with that. I feel really good that the Orthodox, um, as I said, that three people um, among those who have endorsed the book are coming from an Orthodox background, are practicing two are rabbis. One is a, the head of the research team of Kolaj uh, Jama, which is the modern Orthodox um, statistical group, and they found value in the book. So the fact that I wasn't asked to speak there doesn't, doesn't bother me. But I can tell you what some have said. You know, I mean, some have some issues with the, you know, you know, the the idea that that I'm suggesting commandedness is an operative among liberally religious Jews. Maybe it ought to be, 
but I'm dealing with reality <laughs> and in reality, it's not, right? And so again, you have to meet people where they are. And, and unless they're doing Kirov, which is outreach, unless they're doing Kirov, but the ones who are doing Kirov, they understand what I'm doing. You know, they, would, they will phrase things differently. They will give somewhat different advice, but they totally get that. And in fact, you know, scholars who really know um, the Kirov outreach community well have, have basically documented that their idea of success is getting their those who they teach more, more connected to their reform and conservative synagogues. That's actually been documented in a book by Jack Wertheimer called American Judaism when he makes that finding, which doesn't surprise me at all. Because most of the people that are, that are sort of dealing with Chabad rabbis and others in an outreach capacity are not necessarily going to become Orthodox because they're not going to live that lifestyle. So again, it's about how do we make it work for people who have a different lifestyle. Well, I'm, I'm, I was first surprised to hear your answer that you hadn't been invited, but I guess you know what you're describing now makes sense. Although I, you know, I could imagine that the sort of remix, that, that the ethics of remixing Judaism would be, should be, and already has been relevant in, in Orthodox communities, given sort of, you know, the, the way that uh, more modern Orthodox communities have responded to cultural needs about um, inclusion and involvement of women, um, uh, inclusion and involvement of the LGBTQ community, community um, how to respond to certain social pressures and realities in the world that, you know, even operating within the halachic framework, um, there are still, let's say, cultural ideological remixing that can be done to, to make Jewish life relevant to people's inner lives. Sure, and some theological remixing as well. I mean, again, you know, orthodoxy isn't monolithic in terms of what people, you know, even believe. Um, and so there's, there certainly is a basis for that. Um, but I, but I, but it's you raise an interesting point about the you know yes so modern orthodoxy especially is is also um, having to grapple you know somewhat with some of the issues that the reform movement started grappling with back in. I'm going to say the 80s, you know, that like that's really when the reform movement started grappling, for example, with uh, the issue of, of, of gay marriage. Um, and, you know, it wasn't that long ago where their law committee said it's a sin. Right. And I, I, I talk about that in the book, The Myth of the Cultural Jew. It wasn't that long ago. Right. So but but, you know, again, we're seeing that with orthodoxy. But again, I think their boundaries are going to look different. Um, but I see we have a hand. <laughs> Great. All right. Shannon, the floor is yours. Hi, yeah, I um, I was just wondering, I mean, so my husband and I, we have several things that we do enjoy doing in terms of ritual, like, um, while we enjoy going to Shabbat services, I still like lighting the candles and, you know, having challah and, and everything and doing the blessings over those um, for Shabbat, but, um, you know, as especially if you have younger people coming in and looking to, you know, start having um, ritual of their own, do you have any suggestions for like where to start? It seems like some of your examples were based on like external factors, right? Like, you know, the kids having um, some nightmares maybe, so that you start doing this ritual uh, that helps calm them, but it does end, end up uh, getting, you know, wrapped into uh, your Jewish faith. So I was just sort of wondering if you had um, in the book any suggestions, like if you're just looking to start, you know, mm -hmm. they're a jumping off point for people that don't really know where to begin. Yeah, that's a great question, Shannon. Thank you so much for raising it. Um, and as I intimated before, to me, the best, um, the best starting point for um, putting the t your toes into the waters of this beautiful tradition that we have, the best starting point is Shabbat. Right. And and particularly, I would say it's it's Friday night. Um, and so, you know, lighting those candles, you know, lighting those candles and saying the bracha brachot over the over the hot wall uh, over the wine wine first and then the challah. You know, I think those are so critical and they can be done. You know, truthfully, it's not like it's, it's a huge investment of time. It's something that can be done every single week, um, even just buying the challah, you know, um, and, and making the effort to, you know, to buy it or possibly to make it. Um, but I think those are really the most important. The other thing I would say, another kind of nice starting point, and again, it depends on, it doesn't, you don't even have to be necessarily be fluent in Hebrew, but I also love um, the, the ceremony of Havdalah um, and saying goodbye to Shabbat. Um, 
And I think particularly from a kid's standpoint, if you have young children or their young children around, it, it touches their senses, you know, their eyes, you know, to see the lights and the smells of the spices and the feel of the heat on your hands. Um, and I think that's, uh, again, a, a, a beautiful, a beautiful um, ritual that can be done every single week. So kids understand that Shabbat is not just Friday night. You know, I had a girlfriend tell me, like one of her grandsons, she told me this just recently. He thinks that Shabbat is just Friday night because, you know, what's going on on Saturday is not, is, is just a regular day, right? But even if that's the case, if you at least say goodbye to Shabbat, uh, in addition to hello, it's, 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 it's teaching that Shabbat is really a day long thing um, in a way that I think um, is really important. So I, I would say those things, those, those two things would be my, my, my rituals of choice for people that are just kind of at the beginning of their paths. Great. Thank you, Roberta. Thanks, Shin. Other questions or feedback from the group? I do think it's great, Roberta, that we, you know, come from a tradition <clears throat> which for thousands of years has made it a, a priority to, to sit and share a glass of wine and face-to-face -face conversation with the people that you love every week. Absolutely. I Absolutely. But, you know, and that's, you know, that is integral to our, you know, we're, that's not coming from the outside world. That's us and who we are and where we come from. Um, it's not new technology, but if we can- No, absolutely. Lives, it's, it's great for relationships. It's great for families. Absolutely. And, and what's interesting is that in Israel, and, and as I alluded to before, you know, Israel, secular in Israel means something very different from secular here in the United States. Um, but in Israel, even non-religious families are having Shabbat dinner. I mean, that's just part of that of that culture. You know, it's it's, you know, here you really have to work hard. You have to fight, you know, to preserve. Um, Shabbat, you know, because it's a night where, you know, if you've got even teenagers, they're going out or there's activities or, you know, you really need to work at it. In Israel, it just happens organically. Um, but yeah, it's it's just one of the, the, you know, it's just such a gift. It really is such a gift. And, you know, I, I do have to say, you know, for those that observe it like more fully, um, I, I do have to say that there is, there are a lot of benefits. I mean, I will tell you coming from an intellectual property background again, you know, I, I did a lot of reading on human creativity. And what I learned is that the ideal, um, cycles to, to maximize your human creativity is an idea of a burst of energy and then a complete rest and then you a recycling. And so I actually wrote a piece about this, uh, a law review article that, that talked about the benefits of Shabbat for human creativity, um, it, but, but it's true. And I always wondered, why am I the most productive on Sunday mornings, right? Why do I have all these wonderful ideas? It's because on Saturdays, I don't write, I don't use technology and I have to remember everything. <laughs> But that's when I have the space to get really creative. And so I've experienced that myself in terms of um, in terms of how that creative cycle works. So there are benefits even aside from, you know, just just the religious benefits of that. So we have time um, for one more thought or question before we reach the end of our hour. I'm going to drop the link to the book one more time in the chat there in case you missed it from above. Again, the book that we're talking about is Remix Judaism, and Preserving Tradition in a Diverse World. You can see the link to buy it there and available now in a new paperback version with a new mm -hmm. preface from the author. Um, I will also point out that Roberta wrote the very excellent essay about the Eighth Commandment and a wonderful book called Inscribed Encounters mm -hmm. with the Ten Commandments. Um, you've heard us talk about that before. Yep, um, that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, while we're getting close to the end of the hour, Roberta, I just, I want to thank you again for um, what you've brought this evening. Um, any opportunity to talk from someone outside the community who knows and loves Jewish life uh, is always a gift. Um, I, I heartily encourage, as one of the first folks that got to read that manuscript, yeah. and, um, was really delighted about your ideas and your um, and your opinions on these things. I'm, I'm really, really thrilled to have had you join our community and our conversation. Um, uh, it's been really great to, to spend some time with you face to face or Zoom to Zoom. I hope we'll get a chance to do it in, in real life again. Very I soon. hope so. I hope the coming the coming period will give us an opportunity to actually meet face to face in some capacity, Rabbi. And thank you for all of your support with 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 the book and and your beautiful beautiful uh, cover, your beautiful comments, um, which are which are in the book. Your congregants can read them if they if they so choose. And oh, I do want to just mention before we go that for anybody that does. 
um, want, I actually have book plates that I'm happy to personal to write on and, and personalize them and I can mail them to the synagogue and I have uh, bookmarks that I can send as well. So if uh, people are interested in that, maybe, um, you know, you can get in touch with Jason and Jason, you can get in touch with me and I'll uh, be happy to, to mail those out. Great. That's really generous. Yeah, thank you. I think Jason will do those through you. I think that's that's really kind of you. Thanks for bringing that. Thank you. All right, everyone. Well, it's great great to have been with you. Great to learn with all of you, as always. Uh, you. Such a great pleasure to, to learn from a new teacher and uh, to be with each other Zoom to Zoom for another hour. Um, I hope that our hour tonight and the reading that I hope you'll do in Roberta's book will enrich your Jewish lives and your spiritual practice um, and uh, that you too will find ways to preserve tradition in our diverse world. Thank you all for being with us. Uh, Roberta, thank you for your teaching and thank for you, your writing. Thank you. Thanks, thank everyone. you for putting this together. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Laila Tov.